in two weeks since our club has met. Welcome to the January 6th meeting of the Rotary Club of York. Our members are dedicated to service above self and Rotary's four-way test. Leading us today in our opening song and Pledge of Allegiance is our incoming president-elect nominee, Aaron Jacobs, and providing our invocation is Steve Feldman. Aaron. Thank you, President Ann. Rotarians, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Rotarians, please join me in prayer. O oh God of all the nations, I saw a poster the other day that I believe you put there for my edification. It showed phrases from many different world religions and philosophies, all saying essentially the same thing, that we are to treat others the way we would hope to be treated. Thank you for putting this in front of me. I need reminding from time to time. The ideals of Rotary radiate this commitment to mutual respect and concern. The questions of the four-way test and our mantra of service above self call for looking beyond the me in life and toward the we of living together. May our Rotary New Year's resolution be that we live 2021 mindful of this commitment and to find new and exciting ways to put it into practice. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Steve. And speaking of radiating the ideals of Rotary, it is with a heavy heart that our club members learned of the passing of fellow Rotarian Henry Kirkpatrick on Christmas Day. Henry's son, Bob, shared these words, quote, he was evacuated from the front lines of the Battle of the Bulge on Christmas 1944. Now, 76 years later, he has been evacuated once again on Christmas, end quote. Henry was a member of the Rotary Club of York for more than 57 years, our most senior active member at age 96, and he will be sadly missed. A funeral, a future memorial date will be determined. Rotarians, would you please join me in a moment of silence in memory of Henry? Thank you very much. When we finally return to in-person meetings at the Country Club of York, we need to place a ceremonial two desserts at Henry's seat in commemoration of a sweet man and his sweet tooth. Now for a few announcements, um, the application deadline for the Literacy Committee book drive is the 15th of this month. Please contact Deb Harrison with any questions. On Monday morning, our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee will meet at 8 a.m. And as always, program suggestions are welcome. Please direct those to past president and program committee chair, Mike Summers. In case you missed it, the Rotary Club of York recently announced the retirement of our longtime executive coordinator, Bert Oberdick. Bert has faithfully served the Rotary Club of York for nearly 30 years, overseeing dozens of active committees, providing meeting details, working closely with the Rotary Club of York Board of Directors and our Charitable Endowment Fund Board invoicing, tracking, and reporting all financials, and so much more. Bert has always exemplified the Rotary four-way test and consistently models the values of Rotary. Her last day is scheduled for March 31st. Congratulations, Bert, on this exciting new chapter of your life. 
The job description and application information are available on our website. Thank you for sharing with your networks and folks you feel would be interested and qualified to serve our club. The great cycle of life is evident at our Rotary meeting today. Congratulations to Brian and Ashley Grimm on the birth of their daughter, Evelyn Rose. The Grimm family grew by one in the wee hours of the morning on December 30th when they welcomed baby girl Evie into the world. Congratulations, Brian. Next up is our business spotlight. Explore York. Explore York is York County's official tourism promotion agency. Their mission is to maximize tourism expenditures and their economic impact in York County, PA through comprehensive tourism sales and marketing programs. Tourism is an economic driver for our world and also for our county businesses, delivering visitors to the doorsteps of restaurants, hotels, retailers, and attractions. Those visitors spend more than $1 billion annually in York County. Sporting tournaments, events, group tours, and meetings contribute to the success of our local businesses and thousands of our tourism employees. The COVID pandemic has had a drastic impact on tourism industry worldwide, and that includes York County. Every corner virtually of the hospitality industry has been hit hard with economic losses. Explore York has sought to support and advocate for the tourism industry through this challenging time utilizing e-newsletters, a dedicated COVID-19 resources page on yorkpa.org, and opportunities to work together on promotions. They have worked tirelessly for the industry. Throughout the pandemic, Explore York has promoted York County through their website, social media, blog post, billboards, advertising, and by hosting travel writers. Their team remains focused on marketing and advocating for York County tourism industry through the recovery process and beyond. Many of you know that I had the honor of working for the York County Convention and Visitors Bureau, the predecessor of Explore York for a quarter of a century, and with Laura Guerrero for 16 of those 25 years. Thank you to my former colleague and Rotarian Laura Guerrero, president of Explore York and Rotary Club member since March of 2019 for providing that information. Now on to our weekly poll. What are your intentions to receive the COVID-19 vaccination? Are you potentially required by your personal or professional constraints or opportunities to receive the vaccine? Will you voluntarily receive the vaccine when it's available? Do you plan to wait? Or are you planning to opt out of receiving the vaccine? I think I heard on news today that there were some 5 million vaccines that have been administered. Give it a few more seconds here, Ann. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Matt. Looks like we have about 76 people out of 88 that have voted. That's really great. We have about 90% who voted. And let's give it 10 more seconds here. A lot of votes, last minute votes are coming in here. We've got about 80 now. Looks like there's about eight of you who haven't voted. If you'd still want to vote, you still can. Three, two, one, and we'll end it here. And we are going to share these results with you so you can see them on your screen. So there you go, Ann. Oh, excellent. Okay, so 80, 84% will voluntarily receive the vaccine. Only 2% required by work and living environment. Interesting. 12% plan to wait and one uh, plan to opt out. So interesting. Thanks for that feedback, everyone. Um, this is certainly a, a critical point for our country and our community and really the world. We, the, just in the news about the, the European Union being frustrated about the circumstances of their vaccine availability. So thanks for that input. Next, I'd like to invite past president Josh George to the virtual Rotary podium to introduce and induct a new member, Josh. Thanks, President Ann. Fellow Rotarians, it's so great to be with you. Uh, here's to hoping that 2021 is a little bit less chaotic and perhaps a little bit more normal than 2020. And it's a good time to kick off the year with a new member induction into our Rotary Club. So today I'd like to introduce you to Adam Sauble. Adam is a Dallas Town High School graduate and also a graduate of Elizabethtown College where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration with a concentration in Finance. 
Adam is the owner of Sauble Financial, which is part of the Northwestern Mutual Group. And uh, Adam actually works in the Lancaster office of Northwestern Mutual. Um, I'm told, but don't actually know this personally, that Adam also may know a thing or two about grocery markets. Um, perhaps uh, he might want to mention that, but that's my understanding. Um, Adam's civic interests and activities include, uh, he is an assistant treasurer and board member for the Margaret Malhome. He was a member, a graduate rather, of the Future Leaders of York program and serves on the committee for that program. Uh, he's a board member of the York State Planning Council and also a volunteer at Junior Achievement. His interests are running, sports, road trips, visiting all the national parks in the country, and board games. And Adam was proposed by Rotarian Jeff Smith. Rotarians, will you help me welcome Adam as a new member of our club? Thank you, everybody. Um, nice to meet you. I apologize that it's on a virtual basis, but uh, Josh, thank you for the introduction. Um, Jeff Smith, thank you for the introduction to Rotary as well. Um, it's a great honor to be part of uh, such a great club, and I'm fortunate to have some prior relationships with you all, but I'm looking forward to meeting everybody um, sooner rather than later, whether it be virtual or in person. So, thank you. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Congratulations to you, Adam, and thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for proposing Adam at this time. Uh, the Sauble family owns and operates four Surefine grocery stores in our community. And I, when I was a little girl, I would accompany my grandfather to the Shrewsbury store on weekends. We didn't use the front entrance. We would go in the produce entrance because we were there to sell fresh strawberries and the best sweet corn in Southern York County that my grandfather grew on his farm. The Sauble family is heavily involved in the community and clearly that community, that commitment is generations deep. Welcome to our club, Adam. Today you will become a member, and when you join a committee and get involved is when you truly become a Rotarian. So congratulations to you. Looking forward to it, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do wanna let our club members know um, that uh, on a monthly basis, uh, we gather at the district level with uh, president, president-elect and district leaders. Patty's in, involved with those and Elizabeth Wolf is our um, uh, assistant governor. And at our last meeting in December, I learned that the Lancaster Rotary Club has had an increase in members. So that's a little challenge for us here in York. And what I learned was that they have been very successful in attracting younger members, which as you can see, Adam is one of those, and those younger members have been very involved in recruiting new members. So Adam, we encourage you to hit the ground running. You have a lot of contacts in your business, and uh, please welcome others to follow your lead and join our club. And club members, all 80-something of you on this call, you know, what better for a New Year's resolution in 2020 to join the Rotary Club of York? So please support John Toy and all those involved in the membership committee that are working hard to retain and grow our numbers. Um, certainly now networking and connecting is even more important. We offer a great opportunity to our community. Next, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our youth leadership students of the month. And I believe that uh, Tim is going to introduce them. Tim. Thanks, President Ann. I'm very excited to uh, share with you two outstanding York Catholic juniors. Uh, the first is Ali Barda. She's the daughter of Sherry and Greg Barda. Some of her school activities is she's a student council representative. She's a National Honor Society member, a girls varsity tennis player. She's also the founding member and president of the Entrepreneurship Club. And she's on the mock trial team. And uh, she's in the musical pit as a violinist. Some of her high hobbies are uh, Taekwondo uh, and, uh, and she's a leadership member as well as an instructor for that at the, with the Dover Dragons. And she's a gain volunteer. Other awards and distinctions for Allie, she is a York Catholic speech finalist, a second degree black belt, honor roll since uh, freshman year and a Taekwondo national medalist. Her career plans, she wants to be a private private equity investor analyst, and she would prefer to, that to be in Boston, Massachusetts, 
And she also wants to consider being a hedge fund real estate in investor. The second student is Nate Gingrich. He's the son of Trent and Deborah Gingrich. Nate's uh, school activities include marching band, jazz band combo, jazz band, brass choir, musical pit, as well as the cast, and student council member, student ambassador, National Honor Society member, and he plays varsity tennis. Some of Nate's um, hobbies include trumpet playing, tennis, and musical theater. His awards and distinctions include District 7 Band uh, from grades 8 through 11, District 7 Orchestra through 10th grade, Regional Band in 10th, Regional Orchestra in 10th, All State Band in 10th, and York White SO 9 through 11. Nate's con contemplating engineering, so I may have to talk to Nate sh shortly after graduation. Thank you. Hi, I am Ali Barda, and I am a junior at York Catholic High School, and I want to share with you all something that has had profound impact in my life, Taekwondo. Taekwondo never measures a person by his or her own limits. Rather, Taekwondo only sees one's potential, and thankfully for me, Taekwondo rejected the notion that I was a painfully shy child, and instead cultivated the confidence buried deep within me. For over 10 years, I have dedicated myself to the sport of Taekwondo. In this time, I've learned not only to set goals, but to work hard to obtain those goals. Currently, I'm working towards my third degree black belt. I've also participated in many tournaments. My tournament wins, including a win at nationals, have certainly boosted my confidence, but my losses have also humbly shaped my character. In these losses, I have learned one, to always respect and honor my opponent's wins. Two, to learn from my mistakes. And three, to work hard in the interim to make self-improvements. Finally, grateful for the sport's profound impact on my life, I now embrace leadership roles, such as being an instructor in the sport. It is my hope that I can be an instrument of positive change in the lives of my students, just like my instructors have been in my personal life. Finally, I owe a debt of gratitude to you all here before me, the respected local and professional leaders of the Rotary Club of York, who encourage and foster service in our local community. Thank you for selecting me as the January Student of the Month. It is an honor and a privilege to be recognized for my skills and service, both inside and outside of the classroom. And I hope to honor your trust in me by continuing to lead and serve within our community in the years that follow. Hello, my name is Nathaniel Gingrich and I am a junior at York Catholic High School. I play the trumpet in York Catholic's marching band and since seventh grade, marching band has been by far the most impactful extracurricular to me, sharpening my useful values of hard work, leadership, and dedication. I learned quickly how much can be accomplished with simple focus and organization which would be much more useful to me than I had ever even imagined in elementary school. Within the past two years, I gained the opportunity to be able to explore leadership and grow on myself because of it. In 10th grade, I was promoted to the trumpet section leader, where I would lead sectionals during practice and would help the members of my section with music and marching techniques. Later, I was elected to be the junior drum major of the band, which forced me to take on a more active role as a leader, and I will go on to be the senior drum major for my last high school marching band season. Being the drum major gave me an even larger task of more vital leadership and made me think more on my feet as what decisions I made and what things I said affected a much larger group of people. Overall, marching band is an activity that is much more difficult than what it is counted for, whether for the musical and physical endurance required, countless hours of exhausting practice, or by full Saturdays spent at marching band comp competitions. Although taxing, my true passion for the enriching activity has never failed to bring me back to the sign-up sheet every year, an attention-grabbing reminder of what I have really learned about myself. When motivated, focused, determined, confident, and optimistic, there is no note I cannot hit, no star that is too many miles away from my reach. I am capable of achieving anything I set my mind to, even if I feel as exhausted as band camp when I still have six hours of my day left. I am powerful, fueled by care, 
passion, effort, and motivation. Marching Band has engraved this into me for the remainder of my life. Thank you, Rotary, for giving me the opportunity to speak as a representative of your Catholic high school. Thank you, Tim, and to your committee for bringing these wonderful students to our club. What a way to kick off the new year. I don't know about you Rotarians, but I, whenever we host Students of the Month, it's, it's a mixed blessing because it reminds me of my misspent youth. But even more importantly, it is amazing to hear from these impressive young folks in our community and to see their confidence, their achievements, and their aspirations. So congratulations to you, Allie and Nate, and thanks again to Tim and you and your committee for bringing these wonderful students to our club. Both Allie and Nate will receive Scholastic Achievement Award certificates. And now to introduce our program, past president Mike Summers. Can't help, Ann, but think about your misspent youth. I, you were down the hill a little bit from me, but I, I didn't see you do anything bad, I, I can remember. Our speaker today is Auditor General Eugene De Pasquale. Uh, Eugene is completing his second and final term as Pennsylvania's 51st Auditor General. The Auditor General is responsible for ensuring that all state money is spent in a legal and proper way. In 2012, Eugene became only the second statewide elected official from York County. He joined Governor George Leader, who was the first in uh, 1954, and then, of course, our own Governor Tom Wolf followed Eugene's successful run two years later in 2014. Eugene has been very kind and has come to our club many times to address us. And to some degree, I'm a little disappointed that we uh, can't do this live, Eugene, uh, because we all would very much like to thank you for, A, your efforts and on our mm -hmm. behalf, but also your commitment to the Rotary Club of York of coming and presenting. Eugene, as Auditor General, has focused audits on areas that will improve the lives of all Pennsylvanians and deliver on his promise to be tough, fair, independent fiscal watchdog for Pennsylvania taxpayers. Over his past eight years, his audits have identified more than $1 billion of taxpayer dollars that is either misspent or potentially recoverable state funds. Some of the Auditor General's office responsibilities are auditing state agencies, school districts, municipal pension funds, liquor stores, hospitals, and corporate tax returns. Eugene has been very busy these past eight years. He is most proud of the work that led to fixing the state child abuse hotline where more than 58,000 calls went unanswered before his audit. He's also very proud of nearly eliminating the huge backlog of untested rape kits in Pennsylvania, along with tackling the pharmacy benefit managers to help lower prescription drug prices. Eugene was born and raised in Pittsburgh, but he has been living in York County for decades now. He enjoys following his son Ben and daughter Sarah as they pursue music and sports in college and high school. And he's also very active coaching young athletes in both baseball and football. In his spare time, and that's in quotes, spare, uh, he trains to defend his title as only the, the only statewide elected official in the nation who is a four-time Spartan race trifecta finisher. We'll take it on good faith that you have audited that statement, Eugene. <laughs> Prior to his service as Auditor General, Eugene was also a state rep in Harrisburg serving the greater York area. Eugene will fill us in on what he's experienced and learned in this important role as uh, Auditor General serving the taxpayers of Pennsylvania. Fellow Rotarians and guests, I would ask that you virtually welcome warmly and thank York's very own State Auditor General Eugene Diaz Pasquale for his years of public service to the state and to our community. Thank you, Mike, and um, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, uh, we really want this to more turn into a Q&A, but as I've got uh, now slightly less than two weeks, it's sort of you go down memory lane of the, the Facebook alerts of what you were doing uh, eight years ago. And um, as I'm beginning to clean out the office, while at the same time still have uh, two uh, pretty big reports coming out, one coming out tomorrow um, on our continuing work on preventing child abuse uh, in Pennsylvania as well. So still not done yet, slightly less than two weeks, but 
I have enjoyed every second of um, this position. Um, there's still those moments where I, I find it hard to believe I got elected in the first place. I started the campaign in 2011, had no money um, and no real statewide name recognition. I had you know, some obviously name ID in the York County area and some in the Pittsburgh area, but beyond that, not much. And we ended up winning and reelected in 2016, even though um, Donald Trump carried the state as well and won um, both elections actually pretty convincingly. Um, you know, sometimes you, you, know, you, you work hard, maybe get a couple breaks here and there. And it's allowed me to have what I think is one of the best public service jobs anyone could have um, in the United States. I've been honored to do this every day. And so whether it's uprooting waste or making state government programs work better, look, um, I, I also take enormous pride that if you actually read the audits, whether it was Governor Corbett, when I came in, who was a Republican, obviously I'm a Democrat, or Governor Wolf, and we're both Democrats. When you actually read the audits, I'm not talking about sort of the reading the Facebook comments and, and that type of thing, but actually read the audits, you would not know which party I was or which party I was audit, auditing. And I take enormous pride in that, my, and so does my team. And that's to me what the job should be. And that my successor, um, we met privately in my office yesterday, Tim DeFore, even though he's a Republican, I know he shares many of those same values. and. Um, and I'm going to be looking forward to seeing how he does moving forward. And I'm sure he's going to, you know, give the same type of independent watchdog that the people of Pennsylvania deserve. This is the second oldest elected executive office in Pennsylvania. The office of governor was created, then the office of the auditor general was created, and it was created to be an independent watch on the chief executive of the state. That's the role. And sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Sometimes you don't have a lot of buddies in state government, but um, that's fine. That's, that goes with the territory. Um, my final point is I take enormous pride that the legislature always tried to cut my budget because they didn't like the, uh, the things I was going after. Um, and my answer to that was if everybody was comfortable with what I was doing, then I wasn't doing my job. So as I again, have about less than two weeks now to, you know, uh, finish out my role, finish out strong, and then move on to the next adventure in life, um, which tragically will not be playing in the major leagues. And I think that's pretty clear. Uh, Mike Summers and I, we coach against each other in Legion baseball when we're able to do that. But I'm pretty sure as bad as the Pirates are that they don't, they haven't gotten as low to need me on the mound. Although considering the recent trade of Josh Bell for a couple stiffs, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's what I'll be doing next. So I'm um, looking forward to the next challenge, but I've always appreciated whether it was in the state house or my time as auditor general, always coming to Rotary. The questions, the dialogue have always been top notch, um, always insightful, um, good natured. And even when there's disagreements with members in the audience, I, to me, I, one of the things that I'm most concerned about as a country is that um, we're, we're starting more, it's getting exacerbated over time. And that is getting into these bubbles of where you are only talking to people you agree with. And if I have one major concern, yes, obviously COVID, you know, how we deliver healthcare, the economy, all those things are important. But my most overarching concern of the future of our country is people getting into their bubbles or their silos. And I do view York Rotary as one of the entities that tries to help get us out of those comfort zones, get us out of our silos and talk to people that we you know, maybe even if we're all in the same party or all in different parties, the dialogue at Rotary is always about how do we find ways to, you know, move our region or whether it be your county, our state or our country forward. And so I've always appreciated those dialogues. And um, Mike, thanks again for the invitation here of the discussion we had during my campaign for Congress, which I thought again, you know, look, I considering COVID and all that other stuff, but um, I thought it was one of the, one of the most, uh, you know, fun dialogues I had in the whole campaign. And just as a final note to let you know how silly some of this can get, we'll leave that on a humor note before and I said on there, um, because everything gets filmed nowadays, you know, if you're, you know, uh, everything's on film. Um, so I said in there that, you know, hey, look, I'm a moderate on economic issues, but social on, uh, liberal on social issues. 
And so the national Republicans took that quote and then put it on Twitter and say, see, he's conceded, he's a liberal. Uh, so, and, it, it, and it's sort of like going, you guys, come, come on. It's like, sort of like, yeah, but it didn't change three votes. I mean, it was just them talking to themselves, you know, getting everybody into some DC office all high-fiving each other that I conceded it like, you know, I, I didn't think the government should interfere with women's private decisions on their bodies, you know, or whatever. Uh, but I, I just uh, like, that's how silly some of this can get. And by the way, it's a both sides issue, but I just to let you know that they caught, they caught me on video conceding that, uh, which I always thought like, uh, whatever. <laughs> but I just want to let everyone know that on a humorous note, that's how some, how silly some of this can get, but you at York Rotary always are trying to not be silly in that sense. We talk to each other, we listen, and we try to find ways to move our region forward. And I've always appreciated that. Eugene, thank you so much for your service, your um, career in public service locally and at the statewide level. And we do have a thank you to you and your staff for all that you have done during your tenure, especially relative to the backlog rate kits. That's a comment from a member of our club. We have a question for you, Eugene. Yeah. What areas of the Commonwealth should your successor be concentrating in over the next few years? Yeah, I do think, uh, well, there's probably, you know, look, you, you, there's so many areas that state government touches, but I do think uh, the effectiveness of healthcare spending um, that's something that certainly some more focus could be on It's particularly the effectiveness of the Medicaid expansion and how effective that's been. Are there ways to deliver that service to more people? Are we getting the best bang for our buck? The health in general, and again, this ties into COVID as well. I think we have two sides of the health debate. One, we talk about a lot, which is the insurance side. The other part is the actual health of people. And I don't think we have nearly enough discussion of that. And how are we do, or, and particularly nutrition for children, et cetera. So I, I do think that's another area um, for uh, Auditor General, Lex, soon to be Auditor General Tim DeFore to focus on as well. Um, and and I, look, I know that there is you know, a lot of uh, discussion about the electoral system. One of the ways that he could have an impact on that without seeming overly partisan is that he could follow up on the audit we did on the state's voter registration database and its security, um, the security of that system um, and all and the changes the Department of State said they were gonna make, which again, I think some of them they have, some of them they may not have, is a way to you know, give further confidence to the electoral system of the state as well. So those are some areas, um, but you know, look, he's got a lot of work in front of him. I, hopefully he continues again, this is his decision. Um, the work we've done on, on the school board or on the school districts and the charter schools and the cyber charter schools, because there's nothing more important for state government than the education of our children, making sure that more dollars are getting to the classroom as well. So those would be some of my thoughts, but he's a, he's a bright person and I'm sure he's gonna do a great job. Thanks, Eugene. This is a question from a member. What is next for you, Eugene, besides those baseball dreams? Are you yeah. going to take a vacation or <laughs> right into your next adventure? And then also a plug, you may now have to become a Rotarian. Yeah, um, so uh, actually more than happy to become a Rotarian. Um, uh, so uh, look, although I got to make sure I can make the, make the lunches because I know you're sticklers <laughs> on you know, when I have to do the once every two years, I don't have to worry about the attendance. I've already committed to being an adjunct professor of law at Widener University. I've got a couple other options that I've been um, weighing um, because I, I wanted to be, and I'm a stickler on this, not committing to anything that could potentially be a conflict with my duty. So I've been having some discussions with various entities, whether it be you know um, federal, state, um, private sector, certainly some other options there. And I, you know I'll hopefully be able to you know, announce something formally by the end of the month. But I've been, I had, and again, this may be stupid financially, but I've always had in my mind that I'm not going to commit to a job until the day I'm, you know, again, I'm not saying I'm not talking to folks. I don't want to be cute about this, but I wasn't going to commit to an employment situation until my last, until I was done with this office to avoid any potential conflicts of interest. Now, vacation wise, I turned 50 this year. So uh, my son and I are going to do Pikes Peak for my 50th. 
Um, so that's um, I, some people may not view that as a vacation, but I do. So that's the uh, that's and my daughter wants to go to Montreal. So uh, the, uh, they don't they just wanted to do different stuff. So um, but if you the, uh, I've been to Montreal before, but I'm looking to take it on uh, Pikes Peak uh, for my 50th. Eugene, con congratulations on your half century this year. Um, speaking of vacation, there's a question from a member who wants to know if you are going to keep your campaign promise. And I think that had something to do with toes in the sand and drinking a hand. Wait, say that again? Well, you promised to end up on a beach. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've kept most of my campaign promise. I was not because of COVID, I didn't have the chance to get drunk on a beach. Um, so, so I didn't completely fulfill that one, but no, at, at some point I will, because I got my, my fanny <laughs> kick, I, 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 because of COVID, I couldn't go to a beach to get drunk. So I'm, I'm not going to sit there and say, I didn't get drunk. I'm just going to say it didn't happen at a beach, but that was because of COVID. I couldn't predict that. So you can't totally fault me for not fulfilling that campaign promise. Well, you know, the shores of the Susquehanna River always called. <laughs> that's, that's, might, that's, might be a little I chilly. To, I, I could have pulled up spring scene and just gone by the river, right? I, and, you know, <laughs> and done it that way. But, you know, right. I, I, sometimes you just have to sit in your living room and drink your rum away. <laughs> you can't do that at Cadore State Park, but you could buy. That's that's right. But I could have fought. You're right, because I am a Springsteen fan. Now, I, I feel bad. I didn't fall the spring. Just go down by the river. That's right. Did you the see him on Saturday Boston. Night Live? I didn't. I didn't. Oh, it was I'm, great. I'm well, I'm sure he was great. Yeah. Back to your comment about joining the club. These meetings are videotaped, so we're much less stringent in regard. Oh, you 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 loosened up we those were. requirements don't, a little. Bit. Don't tell any of the members that are, the 86 members that are on the, <laughs> that are attending this meeting, but that's, much more flexible in the COVID environment. That's They're just you, me, and Facebook Nation. That's all. <laughs> that's right. So back to a serious question. Yeah. Do you have any specific suggestions for how we can create more nonpartisanship yeah. about state government? So oh, I would say this extends, I think, first of all, it has to extend to all of us. We have to all be committed to this. And what I mean by that is my political opponent or someone that disagrees with me is not my enemy. If we can't agree to that, then every other idea I'm going to offer is literally irrelevant. Um, because the other ideas all have to flow from that. You could take, you know, someone that, you know, I'm sure there are people on this call. Some maybe didn't vote for me. Um, even ones that didn't, we have disagreements. But if you can't agree with the core idea that we're all Americans, we're all in this together, we are an incredibly diverse country, our York region, Pennsylvania, and the nation are incredibly diverse, that that can be enormous strength and yes, challenges as well. But that we're all in this together. We can't start there. Then uh, all this other stuff, I don't know if it's going to matter. So then, once you get beyond that, one of the things I said, you know, that I was going to do during the campaign, if I had won, and I think I did, you know, to the degree I was capable of as Auditor General, is, you know, sit down with a. There's this thing called um, basically the Problem Solvers Caucus. Um, now, I would like to think that every member of Congress should be a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus. I mean. Ha, duh, that's supposed to be part of the job. Um, but there's a group of bipartisan members of Congress that do this, and they meet every week, and they, and they, you know, without a lot of the lights on, try to work these things out. I think we all have to try to do that in our own lives. And what I mean by that is, I've seen this on Facebook, I've seen it in social media, and the data shows that this is even happening in residential life decisions, that people are moving to places where there are like-minded people. Uh, that makes me very nervous. Not so much a look. You want to go live in, like, that's people's decision. But the idea is that people are basing where they want to live, send their kids to school, all these other items, who their friends are on Facebook, social media, all on the idea of do they agree with me politically or not. So we got to find a way to try to break the chains beyond that as well. Now, specifically, I think the number one thing we could do politically is reform how we draw our district lines for the state house, state senate, and the congressional maps. I believe that the voters should pick their politicians, not the politicians pick their voters. 
district lines should be drawn with the idea of making districts. They should be reflective of the community, but also drawn with the idea of making districts competitive. I will tell you this, and you know, look, Scott and I had a private conversation after the campaign, um, but competitive elections make us better. They sharpen your dialogue, they force people to fight for votes, um, and they force tough general elections where Republicans, Democrats, and independents have a say on who represents them. The more the politicians get to pick the voters, the more they're going to try to make their district safer for a party, whether it be Democrat or Republican, and the more those politicians are then going to worry about the primary as opposed to the general election, which then exacerbates the divide. So I think it starts with all of us wanting to understand that my political opponent or even someone that disagrees with me is not my enemy and that we're all in this together, even if we have strong disagreements, which we should. We've always had strong disagreements in this country. I mean, we're now a country of 330 million people. You've got a country with San Francisco and, uh, excuse me one second here, I'm a little running nose here. You've got a country with San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego on the West Coast, and then you've got swaths of rural America. Philadelphia is literally like an hour away from, you know, Southern Lancaster County, which is deeply blue, deeply red, respectively. So incredibly diverse country. That can be, I think, an enormous strength for us, but we've got to start with the idea that we're all in this together. And then beyond that, I think politically, how we, ch how we draw our district lines is the most important. And another sort of sidebar, I think actually the courts have held up pretty strong on this. We've got to, we've got to be committed to the idea that the courts are not partisan warriors. U a U.S. Senator, it's a Democrat or Republican, like, look, we get there's You're fighting for core beliefs and there's a politics that goes with that. We've got to get better at recognizing that once someone goes on the court, they've got to be removed from this. Yes, a president of a certain party will nominate them. And in Pennsylvania, they run for that. But we've got to do better at recognizing once they're there, they need to look out for the law and not a political party. Thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, just just a segue of your comments about competitive elections. I don't know if you saw on the news today, um, there was conversation about our congressman from Pennsylvania, and I think there were five or six of them put up on the screen, and you know they were all Caucasian gentlemen of a certain age. I, I love Caucasian gentlemen. My dad was one, my father-in-law, my brother, my husband, I love them. But how do we, how do we bring more diverse voices to our political system? Well, I do think 2018 delivered four women um, into the uh, Pennsylvania congressional delegation. So I think that was a huge start. Certainly um, the Philadelphia era, Dwight Evans, I believe, is the only um, African-American member of the congressional delegation. But certainly your more diverse areas, the Lehigh Valley, Philadelphia area, um, and, and the Pittsburgh area have delivered, you know, again, it's not perfect. Um, a huge chunk of Pennsylvania is not as diverse as the major metropolitan areas. But I do think that we've got to, uh, you know, again, you can't mandate who the voters vote for. But I'd like to see certainly more women in that delegation, whether they be Republican or Democrat. So 2018 did deliver more women. I think, again, the more competitive the general elections are, um, I think it forces the parties to nominate people that are more appealing to the moderate swaths of, you know, of a district as opposed to just worrying about the primary. Um, but look, I also say this, if you want to win, you got to run. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, as much as and there's still a tinge of me that's disappointed I didn't win this thing. But, you know, then you see the chaos in D.C. and I go, oh, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't so bad. Um, but 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 one of the things that I stress to people is that if you want to serve, you got to run. And there's a lot of people that no one thought could win that ended up winning and vice versa. So one of the best ways to improve the diversity of the state's congressional delegation, which does need to be improved, in my opinion, it's we all got to, you know, if, if you believe it, find someone that you think would be a good a good member and run them and support them um, because democracy is a participant sport. It is tough. You got to be willing to, you know, take a punch. You got to be willing to deliver a punch, you know, obviously in a nonviolent way, you're doing it on television and mailers, not actually looking to beat someone up, 
Um, but someone has to be willing to enter the arena. And particularly women, when they've entered the arena in the last several cycles, have done a pretty good job. And I will say, I want to commend the National Republicans on this. After their 2018 bloodbath, they did, I think, a much better job of recruiting a diverse slate of candidates, whether it was women or um, minorities uh, in, in various parts of the country. I mean, there is now a Marine, Hispanic, former fighter pilot who's a member of Congress in the LA suburbs, who's a Republican. Uh, in 2018, I don't think, uh, I think after the 2018 cycle, I think there was only a handful of even women in the Republican ranks in the US House, and there were no people of color. That has changed. So I think they did a good job of uh, understanding where the country was moving on that as well. Back to Harrisburg, Eugene, what do you think could unlock the bottlenecks in state government to achieve meaningful systemic change for municipalities and schools? Yeah, um, I believe the best way to do this is to, in a sense, um, provide sort of a, a home rule across the board, and that is allow more municipalities to have the flexibility of what Pittsburgh and Philadelphia have, which is through their home rule charters, more authority over their own control. So in a sense, Harrisburg, because I, I, the way that the, the rules are now, everything has to flow through Harrisburg and they're just never gonna sign off on this stuff. Um, I think maybe the middle ground might be is give the municipalities more flexibility to make the decisions on their own. That way, you know, if, the, if you can't get the votes in Harrisburg, so be it, they didn't have to vote on it anyway because the authority was passed to, um, passed to the municipality themselves. Eugene, we'd, we'd appreciate your professional perspective in regard to Pennsylvania's statewide elections. Do you feel they were completely fair and proper? Do you feel that there are things uh, that could be done to improve our election system yeah. statewide? So a couple of things. First of all, proper, yes. Safe, yes. Secure, yes. Challenges, of course, yes. I want to say fair. I always get concerned about the word fair because life isn't fair. Um, you know, uh, in the world of fair, everyone, every campaign would have the same amount of money, same amount of supporters, all that other stuff. And, and so I, I, I don't necessarily work at focus on the fair. I work on secure, accurate, proper. And the answer to that is yes. But I want to walk people through what just a general, if I were to sort of, if you were on Mars and I would explain this to you and say, we're going to have about 7 million people cast a ballot in this one state. You can have thousands of workers who's, who are employed for basically one day checking in on that. People from every walk of life go. It, it is an entirely complex operation that has to take place in a very condensed point of view time. And so there's always going to be challenges with that. The idea that, oh, I heard there was this one precinct where this one poll worker struggled with this one memo, therefore throw out the election results, to me is absurd. Every single court that has been presented with, I'll say some semblance of evidence that this thing was somehow rigged is just absurd. They've thrown it all out, Republican, Democratic judges, whatever. But that doesn't mean we can't make the system better. I do think that the records of, whether it be the Department of State or at the county level, they need to be cleaned up more. There are too many names on the list that just haven't been removed that need to be removed. But you need to make sure that they're doing that in a fair, accurate way to make sure you're not removing someone that shouldn't be removed. But there are a lot of, a lot of names on those roles that they didn't vote. I want to be clear. These people did not vote well, because they're dead, but there were dead names on the role because the, 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 the roles have not been cleaned up enough. I think that is something that, to me, is, is an issue. Um, Look, this was our first year where we really had to vote by mail. I think just like anything else, we're going to get better at it as a state. The counties, as you saw in the general election, were much better at counting at it than they were in the primary. But continual improvements need to be made there as well. Um, but the security, enhanced security of the voter registration database and the continually cleaning up of the rolls would be the most important part of that. The other part, look, you basically have a bunch of volunteers that are doing the best they can on a very intense one day election, which was clearly the most watched presidential election and the biggest turnout in American history. I actually think considering everything involved, it went off as well as anyone could have hoped. 
Thank you, Eugene. I think this will be our last question and it's a two part one. Number one, would you consider a run for governor, US Senate or lieutenant governor in the upcoming cycle in 2022? And number two, what is the best way to keep our elected officials connected to their constituents? Yeah, um, I've promised myself for six months, I'm not making any political decisions other than, you know, I guess I got a primary I might be voting for pretty soon. Um, it'll <laughs> come up faster than we know, but I'm not making any yay or nay. I'm, not, I'm using this time to just sort of reflect, try to get better, get, you know, um, uh, for people that know me, yes, trying to get even more focused on um, back on, uh, on the fitness side of it and um, just uh, figuring out the next step, uh, you know, what I'm going to be doing you know, starting at the end of this month, beginning of February. Um, so I haven't ruled any of that stuff in or out. Um, I'll probably take uh, time later this spring, maybe even early summer to start really sitting down and going through whether I'd want to go through that again. Um, so that so that that is uh, my short answer, which is a def technically a non-answer, but um, I'm, I think I'm giving you the best, most honest non-answer I can give you, which is I haven't, uh, I, I promised myself, I'm not gonna until late spring really think about that. Um, I do know that I've had a good record as Auditor General. I have statewide recognition and now about $10 million in name ID in South Central Pennsylvania. Not all of it was positive. Somebody goes, oh, I didn't know Eugene murdered 72 people. And I'm exaggerating just to make the point that some of these ads and both sides can do it. Just get you know, just get to be ridiculous. Um, and one thing I was on, this is another part, uh, talk about campaigns. If you look at the ads, just Scott Perry and me, I say this in defense of Scott, in defense of our campaign. The ads that we ran that were in control of our campaigns, yes, they were tough. I think mine certainly told a story about my life, how, you know, family bar, dad incarcerated, wounded in Vietnam, losing a brother to muscular dystrophy, and how those things shaped me. And Scott did very similar. Yeah, we had a couple negative, but those negatives were not over the top stuff. I mean, it was stuff that we, and we talked about this, that was, relevant to like why you would vote for us or not. However, the super PAC ads that went after Scott and me, to me are the, I would say, maybe because I'm a little bit biased on this, some of the stuff they say about, I would just say candidates in general is so irresponsible, so over the top that you would think, I because I, I, cause one of the ads they ran against me, it turned out they were running against, the, they ran the same ad again, 30 other races. And I jokingly said, if you were to believe these ads, every single candidate for Congress, and I know there's some people that may want to believe this, should be in prison. I mean, not like defeated, like in prison, incarcerated. And you find out like the rationale for that is that like they voted for something once. And it's so ridiculous. So how the, if we could reform this super PAC nonsense, to me, that would go a long way because as a campaign, it's actually illegal for me to try to coordinate with them and say, hey, cut that nonsense out. So you're not helping, you know, whatever, whatever the phrase would be. And this goes all over the country. They literally, some billionaire has a bone to pick with some member of Congress in name the state and they start a super PAC and then they just can just start running ads with nobody knowing where the money comes from. And they basically can say is Joe Blow is a murderer. And I mean, they'll find some segment of what that person did in life to justify that because if you voted for something that led to something that led to something that led to something, and then pretty soon, I mean, there's literally 70 campaign commercials running that are basically accusing someone of murder. I mean, it's so outrageous, but it's the super PAC stuff that needs to be reformed. Thank you, Eugene. I did have one more question come in. I think we have a quick minute for that. And I don't know what this is in reference to, but your thoughts about the ad about your last name? Oh, well, um, they did seem to uh, want to ridicule the ad where we were working out, which actually from our own polling showed was probably the, that along with me hiking with the kids was, um, and my dad in the Vietnam situation were the most effective. I, I don't know if they didn't know how to pronounce it, um, oh. where they kept mispronouncing the name throughout the whole campaign. I don't know if that was intentional or not, or they were just idiots. I, that I don't know. Uh, maybe they're just idiots. Um, but the one where the ad ended with hard to spell. Now, I will just say this. If all the things 
you can say about me from my now nearly 50 years, if the worst thing you can say about me is my last name is hard to spell, I've lived a more virtuous life than I even thought. So that was a joke, everybody. You, you've kept a sense of humor for, through all of this. Now, <laughs> very last question, speaking of your great sense. Of humor. <laughs> this is the third last question. I'm I know, sorry, I know. Sorry, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. That's Rotary right. Club, they, they, they right. It's the gift that keeps giving, that's right. So this must be in reference to the uh, poster behind your uh, left shoulder. Oh. Was Jar Jar Binks the worst Star Wars character? No, that's, that's a very emotional question. <laughs> Much more emotional than the congressional campaign. <laughs> Um, you know, look, if you want to go down the rabbit hole with me, um, we can do that anytime. We can have a whole segment just on this, but the Jar Jar Binks disaster is still a scar. <laughs> what, what George Lucas pulled off with Star Wars, just from the fun side of it, the storytelling, and you know, some of us that he may even think it's a documentary, you know, all fantastic. The Jar Jar Binks fiasco has to be at least an asterisk, sort of like the Barry Bonds home run record on steroids, has to be the asterisk on the Star Wars legacy of George Lucas. Or the new Coke recipe. <laughs> oh, that's a new Coke. Don't you forget <laughs> nothing. They had 99% <laughs> of the market. Let's screw with it. <laughs> well, thank you, Eugene. We wish you the best as you take a pause. And I'm sure you have many, many options to choose from. It's, it's, um, I'm sure uh, an anxious time, but also an exciting time. And we have no doubt that you'll land on your feet and be doing great things uh, for the next several decades um, of service to our, our community. And thank you for all your service to our community. In honor of your visit with us today, Eugene, we will uh, donate a book to York Catholic High School Library in honor also of our students of the month. We we'll ask you to sign the um, book plate on the inside of that. Absolutely. And the book is Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. We know you're from Pittsburgh. And <laughs> that's by Jennifer DeLeon. So thank you very much, Eugene. Happy New Year. Thanks again for your service to the Commonwealth, our citizens, and your uh, decades of uh, community service. And we wish you the best. Rotarians, next, next week, week you, you join, join us. us. Our, speaker our speaker will be Dr. Dr. James Nari. He is professor, is professor of cybersecurity, cybersecurity at York College, and CEO and founder, founder of CyberCon IQ. IQ. This is a this timely is topic indeed. Remember, Remember you can log, log into Zoom at 11:30 a.m. to visit, to visit with, with your with fellow your Rotarians, and we and had a guest that joined that us today, today. Um, um, Alexis, Alexis Campbell, Campbell, the new, the new CEO, CEO of the Horn, Horn Farm and a native of Reading. So, take care, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for Thank your you service for above self. self. Hey, President Yen, we do have one more announcement to make. Okay. Uh, okay. And we just want to, uh, uh, we want to recognize that we have another birthday coming up this week. So we do want to wish a happy birthday to you, President Ann. Oh, uh, you are awesome. celebrating a birthday on Friday. And uh, from all of us from the Rotary Club of York, we wanted to wish you a happy uh, Chocolate is my favorite. That'll be delivered this afternoon to the United Way, right? Uh, we can make something work. We'll <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Actually, I'm glad you stopped me, Ben. I almost forgot our closing song. Today's closing song is in honor of the King of Rock and Roll's 86th birthday. I happen to share a birthday with Elvis. Love Me Tender by Elvis Presley. Enjoy, everyone. Thanks for the birthday wishes. Take care, and we'll see you next week.